In 2012, at the age of 19, I competed at the Olympic Games alongside my four teammates, winning Great Britain's first Olympic men's gymnastics team medal in 100 years. And this is my story. So at the age of seven years old, I was a really hyperactive kid. I could never sit still. I found it really hard to concentrate at school. I was jumping from sofa to sofa in my mum's living room. Um, I wasn't naughty. I just really didn't know what to do with all the energy I had inside of me. And it was actually a school teacher that suggested to my mum that she takes me along to the local gymnastics club. So I'd never heard of gymnastics before. Um, all my family are footballers. Uh, I can remember my mum rung up the gymnastics coach at the time. She said, what does he need to wear? I went along and uh, in my first gymnastics class, it was just me and 15 girls. Because back then in the year 2000, it wasn't very popular for boys to do gymnastics. But I absolutely loved it. I ran around this mat like a crazy child. Nobody told me off. I thought, this is brilliant. Went back the next week, enjoyed it, started to learn some very basic gymnastics skills. And um, I noticed as well at my school at the time, they had a gymnastics club. So I joined this gymnastics club and I think they used to meet on, I think it was lunch times on like a Thursday afternoon and there was a gymnastics competition coming up and I loved competing. I was super competitive when I was a kid and I, I went into this competition for my school, competed, did really well, won a gold medal, but I was the only boy competing. A lady came up to my dad after the competition and she said, um, where does Sam do gymnastics? Because we think he's got quite a lot of potential. And my dad said, look, he's just started. He does it in the village. She said, we'd like him to come along for a trial at the Not School of Gymnastics, as it was known back then. So my dad took me along. And when you're seven years old, everything is massive. So I'm walking in with my dad. This gym is huge. It's silver. This big silver building looks like a spaceship, especially when you're seven years old. And we get there. And to the entrance of the gym, there's two big double doors. And there's a pane of glass in the top half and the bottom half solid, and I was so little, I couldn't see. So my dad stood there, looking into this gym, seeing gymnastics for the first time, eyes wide open. I'm like tapping him on the leg, saying, Dad, I can't see. And he lifts me up, and I pull myself up like this, and for the first time I see gymnastics, and I'm mesmerised. There's these boys and girls running around, doing somersaults and tricks, swimming, swinging around bars, jumping on trampolines. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Now, after a few minutes... I remember seeing very clearly a, a boy swinging around the high bar. He was going all the way around like this. And when you do that, it's called a giant. I didn't know it at the time. And there was a lady stood next to me and my dad, and she kind of looked at me and she said, you know, if you come here and you work really hard, you'll be able to do that one day. And I kind of looked at my dad and I said, Dad, is she, is she telling the truth? And he kind of said, I think so, mate. And at that moment, the coach asked me to come into the gym and I walked in to a gymnastics club a proper gymnastics club with all the gymnastics equipment for the very first time. And I went in, I did a little bit of a trial. He asked to see my flexibility. Um, I wasn't flexible when I was seven years old, so I couldn't do the splits, so they weren't very good. He asked me to try and do a handstand. I hadn't learned that yet, so I tried to kick up to a handstand and fell over. Tried again, fell over. He said, don't worry. Uh, asked me to do some press-ups now. When I was seven years old, I was the strongest kid in my class, so I did like 10 press-ups, I think. And he said, amazing. And he said, okay, you're not flexible, but that's fine. We can work on that. And you can't do a handstand, but I really like that you didn't give up and you're very strong and that's going to be super important. So we're going to give you a chance. You're going to come on trial for one month, every Saturday for one hour and we'll see how you get on. And that's where it started. And uh, I loved it straight away. I took to the sport. I felt like my favorite TV characters when I was a kid was like Peter Pan, Buzz Lightyear, the Power Rangers, anyone that could fly. So for me, I felt like I was flying. And to get that energy out of me and to go and just throw myself upside down into a foam pit, it was literally like going to a, going to a children's playground and just being let loose. It was amazing. Now, when I started gymnastics, it was the year 2000, and it, that was an Olympic year, but I had no idea what the Olympics was back then. I was just doing it because I loved it. And week after week, that first month went by, they said, Sam, you're doing really well. You're improving. We'd like you to start coming twice a week now. So I started going two times a week, then three times a week, then four times a week. And before I knew it, in a really short space of time, I was training six days a week um, at the age of nine years old. Around that time, something really important happened. A coach called Sergey moved over to Great Britain. Uh, and I can remember the first time he came into the gym. I didn't speak a word of English and I was on the rings trying to do a handstand. And he came over and he kind of like 
communicated with me through hand signals and gave me some coaching tips. And that was the very beginning of uh, what would become a lifelong friendship. And um, I think meeting Sergey and him coming at that time was, yeah, it was, it was supposed to be, it was perfect. And he was the person that introduced me to the word Olympic Games. I'd never heard it before. You know, I was still too young really to watch it on TV in the year 2000. I was obsessed with football. Uh, gymnastics was never on TV. And he started to talk about the Olympic Games and tell me these stories of the athletes that he used to train with and some of his training partners that went on to compete in this big competition, the Olympic Games, and won gold medals. And I think that kind of lit a bit of a fire inside of me because I, I wanted to know, what was, this, what was this big word he's talking about? What's the Olympic Games? And around a similar time, I, I got selected for the Great Britain team for the first time. So I was going away, leaving home uh, for weeks at a time, training with all the best gymnasts in the country, doing these competitions, starting to do very well. Like I said, I was super competitive, always was looking to improve all the time and trying to get an edge on the people in my own group. And I started to get some really good results. And in 2003, that was a huge year for gymnastics in Great Britain because we actually failed to qualify a team to the Olympic Games. So the year before each Olympics, there's a qualification event at the World Championships, the biggest event outside of the Olympic Games. And how well you do determines whether you qualify a team to the Olympic Games or you qualify a set of individuals. And it's normally one or two individuals that qualify. Now, the Great Britain men's team did so badly in this competition that we didn't qualify a single person, a single athlete to go to the Olympic Games in 2004. So that meant that when the Olympics rolled around in 2004 and I watched it on the TV with my dad for the very first time, there was no one from Great Britain to watch. It was just the athletes from Russia, China, Japan, and they were incredible. And I was mesmerized by watching them on TV. It's the first time I watched gymnastics on the television. And I sat there in my front room, my dad was on the sofa behind me, and I remember a gymnast doing a rings routine. And when he landed his dismount and turned around, I saw on the back of his neck, he had the Olympic rings tattooed there. And I kind of looked at my dad and I said, dad, what's that? And he said, well, mate, if you go to the Olympic games, it's a very, very special thing. And sometimes the athletes will get the Olympic rings tattooed on them to remind themselves of all the hard work and the sacrifices they made and the dream they had when they were a kid to go to the Olympic Games. And in that moment, I just thought, that sounds like the coolest thing ever. That's what I want to do. And I think from 2004, I really kind of stepped it up a gear and decided that that was going to be me, that was going to be my life. I was going to be an Olympian, that's what I wanted to do more than anything else. And about a year later, in 2005, I competed for the very first time for Great Britain. So I went to a competition called the Future Cup. It was in Austria. I was 12 years old. Um, it was my first international. I went away without my parents on an aeroplane with Sergey, my coach, and some of my teammates. And I did really well, and I won a gold medal in this competition. And a funny story about that competition, Max, my roommate, teammate, uh, future fellow Olympian, his coach had moved back to Slovenia at that time. And Max had actually moved out there to live in Slovenia to train with his coach uh, and was competing for Slovenia, I believe, in that competition. Um, which, was, which is mad when I think back to that story. What an incredible story. And I think that probably just that says a lot about Max as well, that he got up and left at 12 years old to go and train to pursue this dream. Uh, so really, really cool looking back on that now that we both managed then to go to the Olympic Games when we, uh, when we turned senior and we kind of grew up together. But that was super important for me. And I stood on the podium after winning the gold medal. They played the national anthem. I heard it for the first time. The Great Britain flag was raised. I had this feeling of pride in me that I'd never felt before. And I thought, wow, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This feeling's amazing. And that coincided with London winning the bid for the 2012 Olympic Games. And there was a lot of media hype and attention around all the Olympic sports at that point. It was kind of like a, a switch that was kind of flicked. And um, for me, we had just had our funding taken off us in gymnastics because of our poor results and not being at the Athens Olympic Games. So I even remember my dad, I think he was at one point, he was going to walk to London to try and convince uh, the sports minister to put money back into gymnastics because we had a really talented group of gymnasts at that time. Uh, but I got back into the gym, started working really hard, 
I clearly remember in January 2006, just after we'd won that bid, I competed in Austria, won my first gold medal, running around a field outside at half six in the morning in the freezing cold, thinking, I've got six years to go to the Olympic Games now. This is it. I'm going to make sure I'm on that team. And from that moment on, I worked as hard as I possibly could in the gym, always improving. I was training upwards of sometimes close to 40 hours a week in the gym on top of my schoolwork. Uh, the competition results were getting better and better. I started winning domestic titles, so becoming the British champion at two age groups, so under 12, then under 14, then under 16. And when we got to 2008 and the next Olympic Games came around, I was too young to be involved. I was only 15 at the time. But there was a really, really cool initiative. It was called the London 2012 Ambition Programme. And myself and Daniel Purvis were ex uh, selected to head out to Beijing to sample the Olympic atmosphere because they felt we'd have a chance of being there in four years' time in London 2012. And it was, it was incredible looking back. I mean, that gave me a chance to go to the holding camp, see what it would be like training for a few weeks before you move into the Olympic Village. Um, we went and visited the Olympic Village, which was unbelievable. You know, I was just a bright-eyed kid, 15 years old, obsessed with sport. In the Olympic Games, what an incredible experience it was for me. And we actually arrived in the Olympic Village in the Team GB headquarters when Lewis Smith won his pommel horse medal. Now, that had been the first medal, I believe, in over eight years, uh, first individual medal. And it was an incredible achievement um, for Lewis. And that was huge. That was massive for us. And that really was a turning point for gymnastics in Great Britain and Lewis winning that medal. And it was so cool to be in the headquarters when he did that. And the news came in and everyone was celebrating and me and Dan Purvis couldn't believe it. Like that a gymnast from Great Britain had just won a medal at the Olympic Games when four years before that, we didn't even have an athlete there. Um, and I also had the experience of going to watch the gymnastics competition. So we went to the gymnastics arena. It housed 20,000 people. China were having their best Olympic Games ever. Um, they had just won a gold medal on the parallel bars. I was so lucky that I was able to watch the Olympic high bar final in 2008 because high bar was probably my favourite apparatus to watch in gymnastics and my favourite apparatus to train and compete in the end. And seeing that final for me really gave me lots of inspiration and motivation. The, the Chinese gymnast won, I believe. The crowd went absolutely crazy, 20,000 people screaming. And I was thinking in my head, in four years' time, I want this to be me. So I need to take in this atmosphere and imagine what it would be like me standing up there competing at the Olympic Games. Now, after that amazing trip, coming back home, all that did was give me more motivation and inspiration to work even harder for London 2012. And over the next two years, my results continued to improve. I was winning international medals all over the world in Australia, Finland, Russia. I was doing really well domestically, so I became the British champion again, English champion, and things were looking great. My career was kind of on track. And in 2010, really important year, just two years out from the London 2012 Olympic Games, there was the European Championships. So this was super important because it was the biggest junior competition you could do. But it was also the qualification for a very new event. In 2010, the first ever Youth Olympic Games was going to be held in Singapore. And the European Championships was the qualification event. And essentially, I was going to have to be the highest qualified British athlete on our team to get us a spot to go to the Youth Olympic Games. Now, I went into that competition with an injury in my wrist. I had a really bad wrist at the time, and I was really struggling to even train on the pommel horse. But I knew, you know, this opportunity to go to a Youth Olympic Games, just two years out from the Senior Olympic Games, you know, I've got to do everything I can to possibly be at this competition. And incredibly, I went to the European Championships. I won the all-around gold medal. I won a high bar gold medal and I won a team gold medal with my teammates again. And that qualified me for the Youth Olympic Games. Now, I went out to the Youth Olympic Games as one of the favourites to win that competition. So I was the European champion. That meant I was the best gymnast in Europe at the under-18 category. Uh, I went there to that competition full of confidence. Um, the first qualifying event did really well, qualified second, felt that I could improve a little bit more. And in the all-around final at the 2010 Youth Olympic Games, on the first apparatus, I made a mistake and I sat down on one of my tumbles. So I fell down. Now, in men's gymnastics, there's six apparatus. You have the floor exercise, the pommel horse, the rings, the vault, the parallel bars, and the high bar. And I was starting on the floor. 
So I fell on the floor. That put me right down in the placings. And I knew it was going to be really difficult to get myself back up towards those medal positions. Now, I did incredibly well. And I climbed my way back up the leaderboard. And going into the final event, the high bar, I was in second place. And I knew all I needed to do to win that second place medal and win a silver medal was to just stay on the high bar. Now, high bar was my best event. I was a European, junior European champion at the time. And it was probably the routine I was most confident with. Um, but unfortunately, on one of my release and catch skills, I was just a fraction off and my timing was slightly wrong. I caught it on my fingertips and I landed flat on my stomach. And I can remember in that moment being very, very taken back, shocked at the situation. I didn't expect to fall. Um, and I laid down because I had fell on my stomach. I took a moment, I chalked up, finished my routine. And I ended up finishing, I think it was fourth or fifth. So probably the worst place to finish. And I was incredibly disappointed. I was very sad, you know. I was expected to go there and win a medal, if not win the gold medal. So the pressure was starting to kind of build on my shoulders at that time. The media and the press was kind of following me around as one to watch. I had Blue Peter doing a documentary on me at that time during that competition. And I felt that I'd just let a lot of people down. Now I was very fortunate and lucky that I had done really well in qualifying and had five event finals to compete in. So I had five more opportunities to get back out there, give it another shot and try and win some medals for Great Britain now. In the floor event, I think I finished fourth place again. Pommel Horse did a great routine, won a silver medal, and I think that was one of Great Britain's first medals in the Youth Olympic Games because gymnastics is normally quite early in the programme. Moved on to rings. Again, I think I finished fourth or fifth and a similar, similar place again on parallel bars. And I remember on parallel bars, uh, after the routine, my coach, Sergey was a bit frustrated with the judging and he felt I should have got a bronze medal and we ended up having a bit of an argument and I basically said to him, look, I didn't do the great routine. I think fourth was fair. And we ended up uh, basically in a bit of a stalemate and not talking to each other for the whole of our preparation for that high bar routine and that high bar final, which was going to be my final routine and my final opportunity to win a gold medal at the Youth Olympic Games. Um, so not the ideal way to go into that competition. Uh, but I, I remember when I was a kid, I had a gymnastics coach once that said, Sam, all you've got to do in a competition is to get you angry. If you get you angry and frustrated, you then switch it on and perform. And I used to really struggle with pommel horse when I was a kid. So I'd, I'd normally fall once or twice in a competition on pommel horse. But it, normally, if it was early enough in that event, I'd fall, get them out of the way, and I'd do so well on all the other apparatus, I'd still end up doing really well and winning lots of medals. Um, but in this event, I went into it very nervous. I think I was one of the first athletes to compete, so that normally helps. Did a beautiful routine, stuck my dismount, and uh, scored a really good score. I think I scored 14.375. Got a very high execution score, which means that it was there was not a lot for the uh, judges to take off from the routine. It was really nice. Uh, and I ended up winning the gold medal, and Sergey very quickly forgot about our little disagreement beforehand. I was happy. Um, there was, of course, loads of media attention when I got back home because, you know, I was just at this point two years out from the Olympic Games. I've just won a Youth Olympic gold medal. Um, everyone in the country was getting excited for this Olympic Games that was just around the corner. And I think from that moment, probably that's where the pressure began to mount on my shoulders a little bit. Now, the year after that, so 2011 is when I made my senior debut. So I competed at the European Championships in Berlin, did really well, uh, came fourth on high bar. It was the first time a British athlete had ever made a high bar final at a major championship, so I was incredibly proud of that. And to be honest, everything was kind of going to plan. Um, I was following the script. But going into the end of 2011 and that World Championships that again was going to be the qualifying event for the Olympic Games, so that really important World Championships, I had an injury. So I had a stress factor in my collarbone. So at the time, I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't wear a seatbelt. I was struggling just to chalk my hands up. I had to kind of dab the chalk on my hands because it was so painful. I was uh, taking a lot of painkillers at the time just to get me through training. But in my head, I felt that if I wasn't on that world championship team, 
there's no way they're going to pick me for the Olympic Games in six months' time. I've got to be on that team. So I did everything possible to get me there. Now, going into the competition, training was incredibly inconsistent, up and down, but I had such good results earlier in that year. The selectors and the, the national coaches, they were trying to give me the benefit of a doubt and trying to get me there to the start line to give me a chance to compete at this World Championships. Now, the training out there, again, I was really struggling with my collarbone it was incredibly painful at this point you know just sleeping was difficult uh so doing gymnastics was almost impossible but I was somehow managing to get my routines done in the training gyms and we went into the podium session which is essentially a dress rehearsal of the competition and they the coaches decided they were going to do a head-to-head -head competition between me and Max to decide who was going to compete at the world championships in two days time to qualify us for the Olympic Games so the whole team wasn't settled. You know, that's not the way you want to go into that competition. At that point, that was the biggest competition for all of us and the biggest competition for men's gymnastics in, British, in Great Britain at that time. It was crucial. We had to have a team at the Olympic Games and there was a lot of pressure on us to qualify a team. Now, I did really well in that training session. Uh, I got the best score and they said, OK, Sam, you're going to compete in two days' time. Uh, we had a meeting that evening. They said, don't worry about the competition. Uh, the older guys have got lots of experience. If you have a couple of mistakes, it's going to be okay. They'll go and do their job. We'll qualify for the Olympics and everything will be hunky-dory. Um, unfortunately, that's not what happened. And as a team, we had a lot of falls and a lot of mistakes. And it was completely unexpected. And on the first apparatus, because I was the first gymnast to compete, we were on the rings. I did a crucifix. And because I was in so much pain with my collarbone and it was so weak around there, all of the muscles around it were going into overdrive and I tore my pec. Now, I carried on the competition. Um, I didn't have a brilliant competition. I didn't fall off any of the apparatus, but I had some big mistakes. And I could feel my pec in the competition burning. It was like on fire. And afterwards, we ended up finishing 10th in that competition, didn't qualify ourselves uh, or Great Britain a place to the Olympic Games automatically. And everybody was incredibly disappointed. Um, everybody was frustrated. It was, uh, it was a very difficult time. The atmosphere was really, it wasn't very good. It was, it was pretty depressing at the time. And we had a week left in Japan to just basically sit there in our rooms and kind of ex come to terms with what had happened that we'd failed to qualify Great Britain a team to the, the Olympic Games. Um, I also had to deal with this, this injury, this new injury, the pec injury. Um, I had ultrasound scans on it. They said, Sam, you're going to have to take two months off gymnastics completely. You're not allowed to even do a press up. You can't do a handstand, complete offload for two months. Um, and hopefully after those two months, this will have calmed down it will have repaired and you'll be able to start training again. So for the next eight weeks, I literally was on a bike all day doing leg exercises, trying to do something to try and keep me fit. But the whole time I was getting muscle wastage, I was getting skinnier and skinnier by the day. And when the eight weeks was up, I remember it, it was the 19th of December. I went into the gym. I tried to do a press up for the first time and I couldn't even do two press ups. I was so weak. And at that moment I thought, wow, this is gonna be an uphill struggle now. Um, to make the Olympic Games in six months' time from this position that I'm in, this is going to be incredibly tough. But me and my coach, Sergey, we came together, we put a plan together, we hit the ground running, and I did everything possible. I was training six, seven, eight hours a day, doing all my rehab on top of the training, just trying to get back, trying to avoid getting injured. In the meantime, in the Christmas, the boys that were also part of a team at the World Championships, they had a, a test event. It was a second chance to qualify a team to the Olympic Games. It was those teams that missed out on the top eight places. So number nine to I think it was 16, they competed again in the O2 Arena, which was where the Olympic Games were going to be in the summer. Uh, so again, another dress rehearsal, and they did really well in this competition and came first. So that was great for me because... We would secured an Olympic team. That me meant that I still had a chance at going to the Olympic Games. But what was difficult was they'd done so well, it was going to be really hard for me now to get back onto that team. 
Now, the competitions at the start of 2012 were a bit inconsistent for me. You know, I was fighting to get back as fast as I could. I was trying to get all my skills and elements back and also improve my routines from where they'd been a few months before at that World Championships. So I was racing against time the whole, the whole of that uh, 2012 period. It was just a race against time to try and be back fit and able to compete. Um, I did okay in the competitions, but not well enough to qualify myself onto the European team. So the guys went out to the European Championships in May. They did incredibly well, and they won a gold medal at that competition. Now, that European Championships and that gold medal had been the first time Great Britain had ever beaten Russia before. So it was huge. And I knew this, and I was now thinking, they've just been, they've won a gold medal, they've beaten Russia, it's only two months out from the Olympic Games, there is no way I'm now going to get on this team. But I didn't give up, I carried on doing everything I possibly could in the gym alongside Sergei, and at the British Championships in June, that was my last opportunity, that was it. It, I had to throw a Hail Mary and do whatever I could at that competition. And incredibly, in that all-around event, I got the best score I'd ever scored up to that point in gymnastics. A personal best. I had, had an incredible competition. Six out of six routines. And I actually scored uh, a score of 90.9, which was huge at that time. And that forced the selectors to rethink the team a little bit. Now... They were supposed to pick the Olympic team after that competition, the night after that competition. But we had apparatus finals on the Sunday. This was the Saturday. So we did the all around. I won the gold medal. All the coaches sat around a table and basically decided and put their arguments forward as to what they thought the Olympic team should be. So all of the personal coaches, Sergey, for instance, is obviously backing me, fighting my corner, and every coach is doing the same for their athlete. And then you also have the national coaches in there. So he couldn't decide a team and said, we're going to come back. We'll uh, continue the meeting tomorrow after the apparatus finals, and we'll decide the team then. So the apparatus finals come around the next day. Again, I know I've got to have the competition of my life. I do really, really well. I win a couple of medals, and I also win the high bar, my best event. And that was the event at the time that, as a country, we were a little bit weak on. So it was really important for us. And after winning that gold medal, all the coaches got back together in that room and they decided the Olympic team. Unfortunately, they couldn't come to a decision again. It got to a bit of a stalemate. Um, and there were two athletes that were trying to, they were trying to be argued to be put on a team. One was me and one was Dan Keatons at the time. Um, it was incredibly difficult because the Olympic team was just going to be five, five gymnasts. And it meant that if they were going to take someone off, they were going to take a European champion off to put me or Dan Keatons on the team. Now, again, they reconvened, couldn't decide the team. And the next day, I had another meeting on the Monday and they decided the Olympic team. This time, they came to a conclusion. And how it works when you get selected for Olympic Games, you get a phone call. So it's a very long 24 hours when you're waiting for that phone call and you're trying to second guess, you know, are they going to ring everybody in the morning and get the bad news out of the way and then save the good news for later in the day or are they going to do it the other way around? And he rang me kind of in the afternoon. I answered the phone. I was incredibly nervous and I heard the words, congratulations, you've been selected to compete at the Olympic Games in London 2012 and I just could not believe it. This incredible journey that started when I was seven years old those stories that Sergey told me about this incredible competition, the Olympic Games, and watching it for the first time in Athens, in my living room with my dad, doing all of those competitions and all of those steps along the way to get there to the Olympic Games and going through everything I did in those last 12 months, you know, tearing my pec, going through that World Championships, letting everybody down, and coming all the way back and qualifying for that Olympic Games. It was an incredible journey one that I would not have been able to do without my family my friends at the time my teammates my coach um, and without an incredible amount of self-belief as well that was really important I never gave up I really believed that I could do at that point so I was selected for the Olympic Games everything changed at that point everybody's you're one big team at that moment so all five of us we're in it together we're going for this Olympic dream we're super excited everything's positive the buzz is huge the media attention just gets bigger and bigger it's amplified 
And a week after that selection, I was asked to go and run the Olympic torch relay. So I had the amazing opportunity to be part of the Olympic torch relay, which starts in Athens in Greece. It goes all the way around the world to the start of the Olympic Games. And on the opening ceremony at the Olympic Games, they light the Olympic flame and that burns for the two weeks while the Olympic Games is going on. So I was asked to be one of the relay runners, uh, which was an incredible opportunity. And I was given that opportunity because at the Youth Olympic Games in 2010, I'd won my gold medal, but I'd also fell, got back up and didn't give up. And uh, I was told that, you know, they were giving me this opportunity because it had inspired lots of young kids and athletes and sports people to not give up and keep working hard. So for me, that was really cool. Uh, I went to Lincoln to do it. It was, uh, it was raining. It was a typical English day. It was chucking it down. And there was a, there was a person on the bus that I was doing the relay with. So it was a big group of us and someone had pulled out, they were ill and they asked, does anyone want to run two legs? I said, I'll do that. It was actually really heavy, this Olympic torch. So I'm running with it and I'd had to run two legs. And I think I ran for probably about a thousand meters and my arm was aching by the end of it. And I was like, I cannot drop this. This is on TV, but I didn't drop it. It was amazing. I got to keep my torch afterwards. They said, if you want to keep your Olympic torch, you can buy it for 240 quid. And what's funny is the only reason I bought it, I think, was because I thought, if I don't buy this, this feels like something my dad's going to kill me for. So that was the only reason I bought my Olympic torch. But I'm so glad I did now because it's something that I take into schools and inspire kids with. And it's just an amazing thing to have. Uh, so I got to run the Olympic torch in the lead up to the Olympic Games. My training was going really, really well. I was struggling a little bit physically because I'd worked so hard to get back after that injury in the previous December that I'd cut a lot of corners and I wasn't physically prepared as well as I would want to be going into Olympic Games. So there were a few weak links in the chain a little bit and I was struggling with my ankle. Uh, last training session before we left to go to our holding camp at the Olympic Games, I dislocated my finger. So I stubbed the bar on a release and catch skill. My finger was like aimed like this, put it back in. That was the last session before we left. And I thought, I can't tell anybody this. It's just a finger. It will be all right. Uh, for the first two days in our holding camp, and the, the national coaches had decided to take us to France to kind of pull us out of that Olympic bubble a little bit, which I think was a really smart idea. It was very clever. Um, and we trained with Japan, who were one of the best teams, and France at that time. And we just had two weeks of just training. We could just focus on that. We were out of that Olympic bubble. We weren't seeing it on TV adverts and stuff all of the time. We weren't getting hounded by family and stuff all the time and friends and people asking us about it. And we could just focus on our training but for those first two days my dislocated finger was so swollen I couldn't get it into my hand guards so incredibly I went the first two days without training any high bar and none of the coaches noticed which is pretty unbelievable and after about two days I was able to get it in my hand guards and hanging onto the bar was actually okay and it didn't really cause me many issues the only time it was a problem was when I was doing my parallel bars routine I'd grab the back of my legs to do a double somersault dismount and it would because I'd pull it like this it would dislocate it back out and I'd kind of look away put it back in so nobody would notice because the two reserves at the time were there with us and they were basically waiting for somebody to get injured to take their place on the team. I wasn't going to let a dislocated finger keep me out of the Olympic Games. So carried on training. Training was good. We were really well prepared. We went into the Olympic Village um, and nothing can really, although I'd been there in Beijing, nothing can really prepare you for that moment. And I think London was special. You know, we'd we put on such an incredible show. Everything was so well organized. The volunteers were incredible. The facilities were like first class. And when we arrived at the Olympic Village for the very first time, we got off this bus. We'd just driven from France. Um, and when you arrive at the Olympic Village, you get what's called your accreditation. So you go in, they have to ID you. You get essentially a passport that gets you into all the training facilities, all the Olympic venues, the competition arena, the training arena, the dining room, it gets you everywhere. It's literally your passport for the Olympic Games. And we stood in this queue waiting and Max was stood in front of me and I turned around and I did a double take and the guy standing behind me was Michael Phelps. And he was this big, massive, towering figure, the most successful Olympian of all time. And I think in that moment, it really hit me that I was at the Olympic Games, that I'd made it. You know, I was only 19 at the time. I was a kid. I was a teenager still. 
I couldn't believe what was happening and what was going on around me. And we got our accreditation, walked into the village, walked for it, couldn't believe how big it was, athletes from everywhere. And when you're at an Olympic Games, there are so many different, there's 26 Olympic sports. You've got all types of people. You've got volleyball players that are six foot five. You've got gymnasts that are five foot. You've got wrestlers and shot putters that are that weigh hundreds of kilos and it's just an incredible eclectic mix of the human race it's a brilliant place to be um and i was just in awe i was just bright eyed looking around i was went back to being that seven year old that saw gymnastics for the first time training went really well our podium session where we have that dress rehearsal was great we got to feel the equipment the arena was beautiful the o2 was it's just a, such an amazing arena to compete in. I've had the opportunity of competing in there a number of times now. It's, uh, it always brings back those Olympic memories. And the way ha they had the, the O2 set up, the gymnastics equipment was kind of down on the floor and then there was a big, almost a 10-foot wall until the, the seating started. So in some ways it was a bit of a fishbowl and you could disconnect yourself from the, the crowd a little bit. And going out for the first time to compete, so our first day of competition, the qualifying event, I can remember going out, I was the first person to compete, I think, um, and we stood in front of the crowd, and they had the lights off in the qualifying event. So you could hear the crowd murmuring, but it was pitch black, and we stepped up onto the podium. So in gymnastics, at a big event, you compete on a stage. So you walk up these steps, and you stand in front of the judges, and all of a sudden, they started to turn the lights on and the lights rose from bottom to top of the stands and there was 20,000 people screaming and they were basically there for us. It was Union Jacks everywhere and like in that moment, the hairs all over my body just stood up on like electricity and I'd heard that before. I'd heard people say that before but I always kind of thought it was rubbish. I didn't think that ever happened but it felt like electricity in my body. It was unbelievable, that feeling. And we did really well in qualifying. We absolutely smashed it. I had a great competition. I did my five events, did five great routines, and we qualified in third and completely shocked everyone and surprised everybody because we had not been in an Olympic team final for a very, very long time. We hadn't even had a team at the Olympic Games for a very long time. So that was a huge achievement in itself. And in many ways, we kind of overperformed and some of the big teams didn't do so well so they were expected to kind of leapfrog us in the team final and we were probably you know going into that competition not expected to win a medal for sure but I definitely think there was a feeling amongst us that we could pull it off I think everything had been building over those four years in the build-up to that Olympic Games and we were starting to get recognition on an international stage. People were taking Great Britain and men's gymnastics seriously. We had the best junior program in Europe, if not the world at the time. And I can remember that day of the Olympic team final, all through that competition, uh, Lewis had been put in, uh, it was heat waved by Wiley on every time we'd go out to train or compete. And it was, uh, I think for everybody else, it was like they're almost like a, an audio cue that oh, it's game time, it's ready to go. They were super excited for it. But for me at this point, the pressure had started to build. And I think looking back, the Olympic dream for me that I'd had when I watched it on TV when I was 11 years old, 12 years old, it had been this really positive thing to aim at. And over time it started to become a bit of a shadow that I carried around on my back. It was a lot of pressure. I expected it of myself. And, and not because, not in an arrogant way, not because I was so good that I was, of course I was going to win an Olympic medal. It was because I wasn't going to accept anything else. And I started to probably measure my life. And in a lot of ways, my value, although I didn't know it at the time because I was still a teenager, off whether I had, was going to achieve this Olympic medal or not. And so when I woke up that morning and he put that song on, it was like, it was almost a bit of dread and like, oh no, this is it. Rather than being like, wow, we're going to compete in an Olympic team final. Whatever happens from this moment out is just going to be a bonus. For me, it was like, I don't want to be the guy that messes this up for everyone. Because I'd been a scholar of the sport, so... I'd become, after watching that Olympic Games in 2004 in Athens and seeing my favourite gymnast of all time do the best high bar routine ever, 
I'd been obsessed. I became a fan of the sport and I spent my time scouring eBay looking for VHS tapes of old Olympic games to watch them because I just loved it. But also I was thinking, God, surely if I watch as much gymnastics as possible, that's going to give me an advantage or an edge when I get to the Olympic Games and I compete against all these incredible gymnasts. And I think it did in many ways, but I also think it put a lot more pressure on my shoulders. Rather than going out there and focusing on what I had to do, a lot of the time I was focusing on other people and how good they were. So we went into this competition. Lewis has put this music on. I'm feeling that, oh my God, I don't want to be the guy that messes this up. We drive to the venue, we get there into the training gym, we line up. You know, I'm incredibly nervous. And I'm not feeling good on that day. We do the, the, the warm-up, the hour warm-up. Again, I'm not feeling great. And when I get nervous, I have this thing where I yawn a lot. I'm yawning. I, that's making me panic more. I'm like, this is it. This is the biggest moment of my life. And I'm yawning. What's going on? What are other people going to think? But, you know, I'm 19-year-old. I'm incredibly insecure. I am not going to tell any of my teammates or the coaches that I'm feeling this way because I'm thinking they're expecting me to feel the best I've ever felt. And whenever you dream of going to the Olympic Games when you're a kid, you dream of feeling superhuman. You imagine that you turn up and it's the best you ever feel on that day. And I'm feeling awful at this point. Now, I, we start on the pommel horse in that team final. So we're on pommel horse and we're with Germany. Um... So I know that the order is going to be the pommel horse, the rings, the vault, the parallel bars, the high bar, and then the floor last. And I'm not selected to compete on the pommel horse, so it's just three of our teammates that are going to compete on each apparatus. So that means that because all three scores count, if you have one mistake, you have to count that mistake. So you don't want to be that guy that makes the mistake. Now we start on pommel, the guys do a really, really good job, and I'm going to be the first gymnast to compete on the rings. So I go out to the back gym while they're on pommel. I warm up for the rings. Again, I'm not feeling good, but I'm not telling anyone. I walk back out to the arena. I get my ring guards on. I get ready to go. I almost try to fake it till I make it and pretend I'm feeling awesome and get myself in that right headspace. I do a good routine, but take a big step on my dismount. And actually, all of us did that on the ring. So we all took big steps and we lost a lot of marks there on the rings. But the vault apparatus, the next one, again, I'm resting. I'm not doing the vault. We do really well. And Christian Thomas does probably the most iconic piece of gymnastics at that Olympic Games. And he sticks his vault and the crowd go absolutely wild. And I think that kind of galvanizes a little bit. It certainly gives me like a bit of positive uh, reassurance that, come on, we can... I can turn this around. I'm doing a good job here. And we go to parallel bars and I do a really good parallel bars routine. So I score the highest score of our team on parallel bars. And the next apparatus is going to be the high bar. So my event, the event I'm there to compete on. Um, because the, the parallel bars is a little bit of a slower event than the other apparatus. Normally you finish last. And I was the last athlete to compete on the parallel bars, which meant I didn't have a lot of time to get ready for the high bar. We were going to be straight onto the high bar. And as soon as I finished my routine, they put the green light on and we moved around to the next apparatus. So I'm rushing, trying to get my handguards on my hand. And Sergey makes my handguards. They're handmade and they're very difficult to put on. It's not a case of just strapping them up with a piece of Velcro. You've got to get a buckle inside the right hole. You've got to squeeze them really tight. Sometimes I need somebody else to do it for me. So I'm stressing, trying to get this all on. I've got tape to put on and I slip and I cut my thumb. My thumb starts bleeding on my handguards, and at this point, I'm panicking and freaking out, you know. Um, I can't calm down. And we actually changed the order in which we warmed up. So Christian ended up going second to give me a bit more time to get my handguards on and, and warm up. So that was a little bit, that put me on edge because that wasn't the plan. You know, we'd practiced this rehearsal of doing the right warm-up order for months and months now. Um, and we were changing the plan. So that freaked me out a little bit. And again, I'm just 19 at this moment. You know, there's 20,000 people in this arena. I'm aware of how many people are watching on TV. I go back, I sit down, try to calm myself down, get in the right headspace, go through my routine. I start my routine and it's a bit like deja vu. So the similar situation to two years ago at the Youth Olympic Games where I miss that release and catch and land on my stomach. I miss a catch of skill again. And it, we're literally talking millimetres and fingertips. The bar pings, I land on my back. And incredibly, looking back now, at 19, in that moment, the biggest moment of my life, bearing in mind that all morning I've been thinking, I don't want to be the guy that messes this up. 
the inevitable happens and I'm the guy that falls off the apparatus and I land on my back and I'm for, I don't know how I was able to I managed to find the composure to have a little conversation with myself in that moment and say calm down chalk up finish the routine as well as you can I did that I chalked that up got up did a really good routine the rest of the routine and scored 14-1 which is not a bad score on the high bar now, I'm obviously panicking. My emotions take over. I think that's it. I've cost Great Britain the first Olympic medal um, in 100 years. It's going to be my fault. It's going to be all over the newspapers. I'm thinking back to the World Championships when we missed uh, the selection and that environment, what we were kind of made to feel like, that we'd let everybody down, that we were to be ashamed of ourselves. I'm thinking this is all going to be on me this time. Um, but the guys, they pull it together. And Christian was incredible. And in that moment, he was able to keep incredibly calm, do a beautiful high bar routine, score a, a 15 score on high bar, which is huge. And we were kind of back on track. And at that moment, the crowd got behind us all. And when the boys went onto floor, they just hit routine after routine. And the crowd got louder and louder and louder. And I had noticed that a Russian athlete on the parallel bars had had a mistake. And up to that point, I thought we were neck and neck with Russia. Um, and he'd scored a 13-4. So in my head, I'm working out the difference and going, right, we've got a bit of a buffer there compared to my 14-1 on the high bar. You never know. This might be OK. And they did so well that um, when the, the last routine was finished and the crowd had gone crazy and we're stood there and I'm feeling all these emotions, the highest of highs, the lowest of lows, all this adrenaline, 20,000 people, and the results come in and we end up uh, initially getting the silver medal. We just can't believe it. It felt like a film. It felt like I was having an out-of-body experience watching myself experience this thing that I would normally see on TV. But I was in it and I was one of the characters. It was, it was incredible. It was uh, it's something that I think only me and those four other guys will ever really truly understand. And it's a bond that we share that I'm sure we'll have forever. Um, and the celebrations afterwards were just incredible. I can remember we got our Olympic medal, you know, when it was put around my neck, it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was, I just wanted to hug Christian all the time because I felt like he'd, he'd saved me. And in many ways he'd, I'm not sure how I would have reacted to that situation if we had ended up missing out on Olympic medal and, you know, there's no way that at 19 I would not have been able to think that was my fault. So, uh, yeah, uh, Christian was a hero on that day, certainly saved me. And, uh, yeah, we got our Olympic medals, listened to the national anthem, and you have all these flashbacks of all those times when you were a kid running around that field in 2006 in the rain, and you're just so proud of, that you actually did it. You can't really believe that you made it to the Olympic Games and to win a medal, and the first medal in 100 years, given that less than 10 years before that, we hadn't even qualified a gymnast to the Olympic Games. Not a single gymnast, and we'd been the 23rd best team in the world, and now we were the third best team on the planet and done it on the biggest stage of all at the Olympic Games in front of a home crowd. It was just an experience that I'll never forget. Um, and one that's really changed my life. And after that, you know, the the media attention and I guess the pressure in many ways, but also, um, yeah, it all just was magnified and they turned the dial up and we were, you know, I think we were on the front of every newspaper the next morning, which must have been so surreal for my parents to see. Um, and we were just still in this Olympic bubble. We went out and celebrated for a week. Um, but what was really difficult for me at the time was that I had very conflicted feelings. You know, I'd won an Olympic medal and it was supposed to be the best thing and the, the best day of my life. But at the time I had this nagging feeling in my mind that I just didn't deserve it. And I think I, I always see the world very black and white. I've always done that since I was a child. You either win or you lose, you know, you're good or you're bad. Everything is black and white. And I just couldn't quite equate in my mind that I'd competed at the Olympic Games and I'd fell and won a medal. Those things didn't add up for me in my head at that time. Uh, and being a young 19-year-old, I just kept that in my head, you know? 
Uh, I didn't have the experience. I didn't have, I wasn't a well-rounded enough individual at that point to deal with those emotions and those feelings. And I kept them all to myself. I didn't tell anybody. And I just thought, you know, if I'm not, if I don't look like I'm happy and I'm, you know, on cloud nine, everybody's going to think there's something wrong with me. Like everyone wants to see me happy. So I just portrayed this person that was super happy all the time. And I think that probably went overboard a lot of the time. And, you know, up until that point in my life, I'd never really had much of a social life. I'd never really had much of a normal kind of upbringing in many ways. I was I lived a very solitary life as a teenager. I literally trained, played the PlayStation, slept, trained, played every single day. I didn't have any friends outside of gymnastics at all. I'd lost contact with all of them. And I, I think looking back on that now, that was that was probably why I just I just wasn't I don't think anybody's ready for that at 19. And there's nothing anybody could have done to really prepare me for that. But for me I just I wasn't I hadn't experienced enough of real life yet to be able to handle that and the emotions that come with it. And um yeah, for the next six months I basically would just go out and party at the weekend. Um, I discovered alcohol, and I, I wasn't an alcoholic in any way, shape, or form. But what I did notice was when I drank, it took those feelings away. They went away. They disappeared. And also, because I didn't have a lot of friends, you know, in the lead-up to the Olympic Games, I've just been on TV, and there's not many athletes from each city or town that go to the Olympic Games, so I'd been all over local news. All my school friends were then getting in touch with me, uh, and I'd started going out and seeing them in town and that became very intoxicating for me because I was thinking, wow, I've got all these friends now. This is great. I love this. I've wanted this for so long. Um, but it, it, it was difficult. It was complicated. It was, I learned pretty quickly that it, you know, yes, they might have been my friends, but they wanted to be around me because I'd been to the Olympics and I'd won this medal. And that was something I had to learn as well. And um, I think about six months down the line, I, I figured that out. I stopped going out. I got back on track and my, my focus shifted. But looking back now, and I guess that's a really accurate representation of how I felt at the time and how I was feeling. You know, I was super proud of myself and I was proud of my family and Sergey and like gymnastics as a whole it was incredible people would come up to me coaches from different gyms and they'd talk to me like like I'd done something so special for them like they never thought they'd see a British men's gymnastics team ever do something like that and that was really special and the young kids coming up for them to have seen us go and do that that must have been so amazing because I didn't have that as a kid you know it was in some ways an impossible dream in 2000 and five when I decided that I was going to go to the Olympics in 2012 because there were no British gymnasts going to the Olympic Games. So to, to be able to have done that for, for the next generation coming through, that's something I'm really, really proud of. Um, and there were some amazing moments at the time, don't get me wrong. I got to meet the Queen. I got some incredible experiences. I benefited from it financially. I got sponsorship agreements that I'd never had before. You know, my, my funding, lottery funding went up for the first time. All these amazing positive things. We had like the, a full medical team now that were focused on us and supporting us up to where the next Olympic Games would be in four years time after that. So, so much in my life changed. Um, it was great that my family around me kept me very grounded as well. Uh, they've always done that. Uh, so, yeah, it was going back home for the very first time after that, that Olympic Games and getting to my bedroom and kind of being like, God, what do I do now? I've just been competing in front of millions of people on the TV. Now my mum wants me to, like, get my wash in so she can put a wash in. It was just a really weird kind of, like, come down. And there definitely was a period of time where I had... So the the Olympic blues they call it or holiday blues and I was depressed and I, I'm sure I picked myself up by going out at the weekends and getting that kind of affirmation from people around me and getting rid of the the like confusing feelings I had through alcohol um, but I, I'm able to look back at that now in that period of my life and just be incredibly proud incredibly proud that you know I never gave up uh, I like gave it everything I possibly could and incredibly proud that I was able to in that moment at 19 fall from the high bar and keep calm and collected and finish that routine and contribute three scores towards an Olympic medal winning team, create history 
with those guys and um yeah make other people that was certainly Ser my coach sergey it was his dream to go to the olympic games so when he coached me for the next 20 years you know he was able to experience his dream through me and that's something i'm really really proud of uh, that we were able to do that together um alongside my family they were all there watching me incredible memories like i remember seeing them looking up to them in the crowd put my fist up uh and now the the most incredible thing for me about the olympic games and what we achieved there and having an olympic medal is that i can go into schools and i can talk in front of a room of 400 children and they can see an olympic medal with their own eyes and I tell them the story about me being a seven-year-old kid that couldn't concentrate, was always getting in trouble. I struggled to read and write when I was a kid. I had to have extra tutor le tutoring lessons outside of school. You know, school wasn't easy for me, but I found something I loved in sport. I gave it everything I possibly could. And I think the advice I always give to kids as well, when I go into schools now, it doesn't matter what you do. Everybody in that room is going to be good at something. When you're a kid, you've got to try as many things as possible until you find something that you really enjoy because if you enjoy something it's really easy to work hard and when you work hard you normally get good at it uh, and that's what happened for me with gymnastics and that's the message I spread when I go into schools now and I, I show them my medal and I see their faces light up and I show them my Olympic torch I show them gymnastics they see it with their eyes and you can see that if just one kid in that room goes, do you know what? I'm going to go and try something different. I'm going to try a different sport or I'm going to, you know, I'm really good at maths. Maybe there's a job out there for me involved with mathematics or I'm really good. at. I love music. I want to play an instrument. If I can inspire like one kid every time I go into a school, that's incredible for me. And that whole journey and the pain and disappointment and the feelings that I had off the back of the Olympic Games were absolutely worth it just for that. Um... And I, I think if I was going to give a young kid like me who's dreaming of going to the Olympics one piece of advice, it would probably be that the Olympic Games is the most incredible thing in the world. But it's also not what you expect it will be. And the most important thing is that journey, making sure you enjoy that journey. So keep the Olympic Games as a dream. It's a beautiful thing. Like the Olympic Games as a dream is a positive thing. It's something to aim for, to strive to, towards, to look up to. But for me, it became an expectation. And I looked so far ahead into my future that all I felt was pressure. That time, 12 years away, to expect in 12 years for me to go to the Olympic Games was a lot of pressure I was putting on myself. And ultimately, once you get to that place where you're fighting to be on an Olympic team, there's so many things that just aren't in your control. The only thing you can control is how hard you work, whether or not you really enjoy what you're doing. Um, and yeah, just going in every day and giving it your best. And I think that that would be my piece of advice. You know, if you have a goal, make sure, and a dream, keep it as that. And don't, don't let it merge into an expectation because that's when it, yeah, it can probably, it changes it. It changes the nature of what that is. And I think for me, yeah, keeping it as a dream and not an expectation is super, super important. And that goes for anybody in life, anybody that's got a goal, you know. Um, one of my favorite quotes is that the beach is a lonely place to be by yourself. And it's true, you know, if you sacrifice everything for this one goal just to get there, hoping that that will make you feel fulfilled and get, bring you happiness, it won't. I've been there. I've seen it. I've felt it. You know, it was incredible, but it was the journey, you know, and it's the every day and waking up every day and being excited to crack on with a day, having something to do. That's what I loved. I loved waking up every day, knowing that I got to go into the gym and do gymnastics, the thing that I loved. I felt so privileged and lucky to do that, especially at the end of my career. So uh, that's my Olympic story. I hope you've enjoyed it and um, stay tuned for the next episode.